Welcome to Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. Each week, we talk with industry leaders in both marketing and entrepreneurship and business to find out all about their wins and failures in marketing. Right now, we'll hear all about their successes and wins and what's fallen flat so that you can take that knowledge and implement it. Learn from the best, from the folks who've been there and done it all, as well as people just like you. Thanks for joining us. This is Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Market Pulse podcast. I'm Paul, the host of the show, and today we've got a very special guest who I've known for about three or four years now. Um, It's it's exciting to be able to finally bring Rob Dwyer to the show, Um, our second episode ever. So pleased to have you on the show, Rob. I know that you have an incredible background not just the not just the star wars things for anybody who's listening <laughs> along to us but it's, rob's got um some serious serious star wars lego behind him as well as the beatles in lego and portraits uh, rob has got a fantastic personality fantastic story and in keeping with the show whilst rob's not quite a business owner he's very much involved at the very top of his business which i'll let him kind of voice over in a moment and as as ever, like when we when we have marketers on this show, we want to showcase their experience in what's working in the industry right now, and and what's challenged for people, what's working and what's not. And similarly for for business owners, um, you know what what you've got to wear a lot of hats, and sometimes it's useful to kind of understand from other business owners what it is that's working out there right now and why, as well as what's not working and why. So just before we cut across to Rob. Um, quick message from our sponsors, gridbank.io. Um, if you're listening to this, you know I'm all about building content at skill. Uh, sometimes you just need faceless video reels to get content out there. But the problem with a lot of footage banks is they just don't look not native to social. And that actually hinders the content's performance, believe it or not. So gridbank.io is a database of vertical, authentic video clips, great for pumping out concepts, A-B test thumbnails, and creating authentic looking edits. If you're looking to get ahead on socials without burning out your team, you can get 10% off your annual subscription with code Paul, P-A-U-L. And honestly, you'll not regret it. It's really easy to use and it's a really cool platform. That's gridbank.io. Thanks to our sponsors for bringing us the show this week. And uh, Rob, welcome very much to the show. How are you? Yeah, I'm great, Paul. It's it's great to be with you. Rob's Rob's rolling in after, uh, after a big Kansas win at the Super Bowl a couple of weeks back. He's still... Still living the yeah. dream. My Kansas City Chiefs uh, won the Super Bowl. I feel a little bit like I won, but it's also uh, it's a wild time to be a Chiefs fan because we went a long, long time with a, not a lot of playoff success. And to have three Super Bowls just in the last half decade is just insane to me. Awesome. I can't imagine what it's like to have a successful team to support but hey um maybe we'll we'll do what the chiefs have done at some point well you never know uh, for anybody who's listening at the show and wondering what i'm talking about i am a sunderland dfc fan in, in football here in the uk and uh, we have we're very passionate we have very little to shout about generally <laughs> so kicking down to the to the the context of the show then rob um let's start with your fun fact which absolutely blew me away i do i think it had to do with uh my acting career is that right you take me back a long time, Paul. I'm reminded uh, my 30-year high school uh, reunion is is coming up this year, I think. But when I was in high school, I was recruited to be in a Crime Stoppers commercial. So here in the States, we have this. It's like a little short infomercial, if you will, about an unsolved crime. And they were looking for... a uh, you know, long haired, ne'er do well type of fellow. And uh, I know it doesn't look like it today, but back in the day, I fit that description. And uh, I got to reenact robbing our local grocery store. And yeah, that's that's my biggest claim to fame for acting. We got paid quite well for that as well, right? For that free 90 free. No SAG card, no no payment. It was just... Just an opportunity to uh, to help out the local community solving crime. Not many people can um, claim that from their from their youth. Um, as, as I did ten years as a volunteer police officer, so we fit quite well together. We can we can cops and robbers this show, hundred um, percent. 
Yeah. Um, so Rob, give me the give me the fast forwarded version of your career to date, how you got where you are, and then if you would a little bit about your role at Happy Two and and what you guys do. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've been in the contact center space, if you will, since uh, about 2009. Really spent most of my time in training and quality. And about four years ago, uh, we launched a software product and I led that initiative. It's called a Happy To is our brand. We've got a couple of products, including our conversation analysis platform. And it's been an exciting journey dealing with all the things AI related because, right, I mean, that's all anybody talks about anymore is AI and being involved in, in the tech side of the contact center has been a different for me, but it's also been incredibly exciting and I'm learning a lot. Awesome. Um, for anybody who's not familiar with it, what, what sort of things can conversation analytics do? I mean, what can't it do, Paul? It can't clean your room for you, but it can identify what's driving negative customer sentiment. It can tell you, you know, whether or not you're experiencing issues with your website or your fulfillment. It can help you identify how well you're moving customers through a sales funnel. Uh, there are all kinds of things that you can identify from agent performance to business performance. And really, the the reality is for decades, we as customers have called companies and heard that recording that says, your call is being recorded for training and quality purposes. And the reality is no one was listening. Like, yes, it was being recorded and stored somewhere for some amount of time. And no one was listening to it. You might listen to a small, small sample. But today we're actually listening to all of those conversations, not in a creepy way, but in a way that helps businesses identify what can they do better? How can they improve their customer experience? How can they reduce friction? And uh, how can they drive better agent performance? What does, you know, if I've got an agent like Paul, like Paul struggles. He talks over the customer all the time. I can see that and I can have a really productive conversation with Paul where we can work on Paul not interrupting me every time that we're having a conversation. Those types of things are the things that you can get out of uh, conversational analytics. So I love this because we we both kind of, uh, if, if anybody knows me, you'll know that this is the this is the exact same industry that I came from. And it's it's how I met Rob in the first place about three or four years ago, is I was also business development and solutions consulting in the same space in conversation analytics. So I I know some of the answers to the to the questions, but I'm keen to see your spin on things, Rob. I know that there are many, many challenges and I know that you sell to quite a senior audience, which is something I get asked about quite a lot, is um not not so much selling to the senior audience, but how do you market to them and help them to trust you prior to that initial conversation, because ultimately, especially with the the, the ticket price for most conversation analytics, it's not particularly cheap software. Where it's getting cheaper over time, but it's quite high ticket software. It's quite a substantial commitment, and it's an industry that struggles with the, the margin and cost to start with. So it can be seen and perceived as quite an expensive outlay. What sort of things have you guys tried with your marketing that just really hasn't delivered results? And what, what's, what, what do you think the reasons are that it hasn't delivered those results? I think one of the biggest things that we have tried that has not delivered results, at least as of yet, are some of these industry events. I won't name names, uh, but the shows where you go and you you know, spend a bunch of money on a booth and have conversations with people that come by. There are all kinds of different sponsorship opportunities with these. And, and you can spend you can spend more than an automobile's worth of money on these really quickly. A nice automobile, by the way, a, a relatively new one. And we just haven't seen the kind of results that we would hope to see from that. 
have we've done webinars. Um, certainly when we came to market, it was right in the middle of COVID. And so some things were a little bit different in our approach, but I think a lot of those efforts to get out in front of people at those types of shows, really you can get lost in the the mass of the different products and services and shiny, cool things that are out there. And so while we haven't completely abandoned that effort, it has not borne a lot for us as far as, uh, you know, really where we can say, yes, there was absolutely a great return on this. It's interesting. And do you, what do you put that down to? Do you think it's the, it's the wrong format to engage with your audience in that way? Do you think the right people weren't there? What, what is it that you guys are chalking that, that failure to perform mm. up to? I think it depends on the show. So in some cases, yeah, it's not the right audience. There are some of those where you just find it's a bunch of other vendors that are all like, it's just a bunch of vendors hawking their wares to other vendors. <laughs> and that, that doesn't make sense. And so maybe it's, it's a weird situation. Uh, the buyers aren't there. Yeah. If the buyers aren't there, the people that are actually considering how technology can solve needs and in, in their contacts and our operations, then you're just kind of spinning your wheels and, you know, there are other things you can accomplish there. You can see what other people are doing. You can get practice at, you know, your pitch and how you show things off. You can get all kinds of uh, different ideas and just socialize with the people in that industry. But ultimately, most people, I think, go to those kinds of events with the expectation that they're going to get in front of buyers. Um, and, Part of that could be that we've come out of a pandemic where there, I think, are still a lot of people that are hesitant to go to large gatherings like that. And so that limits your scope a little bit. I think there are also companies that don't necessarily want to spend the money to attend those types of events because we have shown that you can find providers for whatever you need in other ways than going to these shows. And so yeah. what maybe once was as an executive at a company, I could get a free trip uh, to Vegas or wherever, right, out of uh, a business expense and, and going to a trade show. There are some companies who look at that and say that that's not an expense that we're willing to incur anymore because we know there are ways for us to evaluate things without having to do that and some companies are a lot more conscious of the money that they're spending in vetting solutions these days so i think there are potentially other variables that go into it but those are the things that are kind of at the front of my mind i think covid you're right actually covid changed a lot of perceptions of these things i think there's a potential that some of these big expos, like we've seen, you know, the E3 expos now closed, closed its doors. Like yeah. that really threw me this year because if something of that magnitude isn't now moving forwards, then what does that say for the rest of the, the expos around the world? Like, and I'm not to say that that's, you know, that they're in a decline everywhere, but I think there are industries where those expos are absolutely essential and need to happen in person. You know, if I think to things like architecture and, you know, like uh, professional solutions and things like that, like there's there's definitely a market because they're hard to define. So and a lot of the time you want to kind of go and meet the people that are sat behind the product or service so you get a feel for them as opposed to the product or service that they offer, which you can probably get pretty much anywhere. I remember going along to our first expo about four or five years ago and um marketing team told us that we were going to take a magician and um i just flipped out i was like I'm, I'm, that's ridiculous like what are we two i'm not t like, this is not a birthday party i'm not taking a magician i am not going if we're taking a magician that's that's ridiculous and marketing team were like no 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 honestly this guy's really good he trains the police 
on how to spot pickpockets. He's been on TV. He's been on stream platforms. He's really good. He's he's, he's honestly he's gonna he's gonna change the game for you. And I'm like, it's already a, a, a horrendous apprehension that I have of attending my first conference and having to drag people in from the aisle to talk to us and show them our software, whether they want it or not. But then to have a magician handing me people, that's ridiculous. And nobody's going to go for that. This is a senior <laughs> audience. They're never going to take us seriously. And so we rocked up and this guy turned up and lovely guy, really nice guy, um, really liked him and very knowledgeable and actually quite professional compared to what I thought in my head. And this was, wasn't actually four or five years ago. It was like three years ago because it was just after COVID had ended. Uh, I think we were in between lockdowns at the time. And pretty much next to no one was there. Like it was a really quiet conference, as I'd been told, compared to, to previous years. We weren't in a prime location. We'd, we'd spend a bit of money on the booth. We, were, we weren't in a prime location. And there was just amazement in the conference hall because this guy was just going out into the hallway, doing magic tricks for people, um, making them laugh, catching their attention, just completely unafraid of approaching people. He was absolutely the right personality for it. And then walking them over to us, laughing, smiling for a warm conversation. And we took seven or eight people to the conference. We had a queue of two or three other people waiting to speak after those seven or eight people because we just had so many prospects lined up to, to talk to. And we actually got practice at like weeding out red flags and, and getting rid of people who weren't a good fit because he wasn't necessarily like, you know, you can't necessarily tell who's who. You're just bringing people in and hoping that they're the, the right sort of leads. You know, people right. turn there, you know, doing that thing where you turn your card around so you, people can't see your job title or the company you work for. Uh, and so, yeah, I think there's a lesson there around maybe conferences aren't for every industry right now um, and maybe never will be again because you're right, like people can do their research online much better than they've ever been able to. But I do think for when you do go to a conference, I'm not saying take a magician, but I am saying you need to do something to stand apart from the crowd and create that reciprocity. And it's not putting a computer game stall in the middle of your stand and, and having people come and sit in your F1 simulator or, or whatever it is. There's something that you can do to differentiate yourself. And really, is, is the rest of the world any different? Like any other type of market any different? You know, we need to differentiate ourselves and stand out from the crowd. So I guess... Well, I don't know. Does that resonate with you? Or is that, like, what's your thoughts on, on sort of the COVID perspective on the expo? Yeah, I mean, there absolutely are going to be expos. And I, I will say, you know, one of the things that we're looking at is maybe we're just going to the wrong events. And what I mean by that is contact center industry events are full of people who are work in contact centers and and contact center technology providers and all of that. But just about every industry has contact centers, right? And they have their own events that are not focused on contact centers or the technology that lives inside of a contact center. And so I think there's an opportunity in those types of events where if you know the industry, if you can speak their language, then there's an opportunity for you to make some, some really good inroads and have some good conversations because you can help, whether it's business owners or senior leaders, understand like, this is how we can help you solve some problems that, that we recognize exist in your business. And so I think, you know, we're going to see if we can get some more traction in those types of events. And I'm not trying to dissuade anyone from going to industry events because I love going to those events because I see a bunch of people I know and like and I get to talk to and yeah. that's great. But ultimately, from a marketing perspective, right, the idea is to get in front of your ideal customers and show them how you can help them. And that may or may not always happen at the very specific contact center type of events. Yeah. And I think you've, you've got to also acknowledge that as a smaller business, it's not like you guys have a full-time marketing team that can just deal with everything on your behalf. There's the lot gets put on plates of the operational leaders that you, you just sit there and think sometimes like, geez, I've got all these other things to do. And 
nobody's taking any of them away for me to do this. And then now I've got to do this as well. And, and it's going to cost how much and what did we get last Mm. time? And I can see why people get really jaded with those things. A hundred percent. I guess moving on to the, the next question then. So where are you guys seeing tremendous success right now? What's working well for you? Is there a channel? Is there a tactic? What is it that you guys are doing that's driving the best for you? Yeah, well, you know, we just refreshed our website and it still has opportunities and we're still going to continue to to uh, improve that and add content. But I do feel like a website is is an important aspect of if someone wants to see what you do without having to talk to you, and I know that sounds wild, but there are lots of people out there that just want to go to your website and see what you do. They don't want to talk to you until they've decided whether or not it's worth their effort to spend time talking to you. And so having a website that communicates what you do, what problems you solve, how you can help, that's really important. And so we recognize that our website had a lot of opportunities in that aspect and and really spent a lot of time working on on a refresh. That's actually very recent, so I can't speak to how well or not well that's performing just yet because we're in the very early moments. But the other thing that it, it's going to sound boring, Google ads are just a way to get at bats, right? To get people to take a look at you. And uh, it's a competitive space and it takes a lot of work to make Google ads really work well for you. Uh, Particularly if you are in anything that is remotely AI related these days. (laughs) Like, yeah, right. Everything's got AI in it. You know, my, my cheeseburger has AI now, like everything has AI. So You have to be really careful about how you execute a Google ads campaign, but that is really a way to get in front of people that are interested in what you do. So as opposed to kind of the throwing darts approach of marketing, where I'm just, just throwing out everywhere, Google ads really are when done well targeting people that are actually interested in solving the problems that you can help them solve. And so we see often a lot of really good success with that. It's, you know, not super creative, if you will, but it is a way to get in front of the right people for sure. But sometimes that's that's the things that we miss, right, is I see a lot of people who are looking for the next big thing in marketing virtual reality market and, um, you know, mixed reality market. And, and then we forget that we can do things like, you know, send somebody a, a direct mail box with something that relates to them and their business that's from us that at least get them to look at our website and, and spend some time. So sometimes you know, just not forgetting, you know, that you can pick up the phone and ring your contacts and, and people that you know, rather than send them an email. I forget that all the time. And yet every time I pick up the phone and ring someone who I haven't spoke to in ages, we have a really good conversation and nine times out of 10, some sort of business falls out of it, whether it's for me or them or somebody else. So I I don't think not all marketing is sexy and exciting. Sometimes it's just about knowing that even, you know, I think even the insight that even in the AI space where you guys sit, technically sit, Although I used to get wrong for calling conversational analytics AI. It's technically the only part is the is the transcribing, right? That's that's the way I got told. I'm not, I'm not allowed to use AI anyway. And I used to rail at companies that used AI otherwise. I'd be like, oh, we're different from them because we don't claim our technology has AI. It's not AI. It's just smart <laughs> logic and reasoning. And, um, you know, even in that space, you guys can be competitive with Google Ads, which... Most businesses might write off Google Ads assuming that they've got to spend thousands and thousands of pounds to be anywhere near competitive. But I think you can be creative even within that space. I'm not a Google Ads expert by any means. I, I don't even use them myself, right? I, I've never used pay-per-click, but I know people that swear by them and can drive immeasurable results by them. 
I think the fact that just that there's something there that you can look at the dashboard and immediately understand how successful they've been is really useful for a lot of businesses. I do think there's an element of creativity there that where you, which words you're going after and, and how you spend that money on Google ads is really the, it's an art form that I don't think everybody should try and replicate themselves to be fair. Is that something Agreed. that you guys manage in house or is it something you outsource or? Yeah, we outsource that. You know, we used to insource it, but I think every business has mm-hmm. to recognize like what's the best use of your time. Uh, the, the people that you have in house, are you utilizing them in the best way possible? And so, you know, we found a a partner that has been doing Google ads for a long time. And, you know, I, I also think one of the things that I'm going to circle back to this, like it's somebody that we feel really comfortable with that understands our brand that, that we can trust and we have a relationship with them. And I think one of the things mm-hmm. from a marketing standpoint that we see more and more of is having the the people that are doing things in your company, whether that's uh, someone like me uh, or it could be a whole bunch of people, but really humanizing them before you meet a, a prospect. And so you can do that in a variety of ways, right? I have a podcast. Uh, you've been on the podcast. I've been doing a podcast for two and a half years. And that's an opportunity yeah. to get in front of people and, and to allow people to understand who you are, where you're coming from, how you interact with people. And they can get an idea of, hey, either I like this Rob guy or I don't like this Rob guy. And that can be really important because some people are just, going to respond to the person that they have to interact with on a regular basis very differently. And they want someone, ultimately, we all want to work with people we're really comfortable with, that we like. And so if you can put yourself out there so that people understand who you are before they actually have a conversation with you, there's a big advantage to that if they come into the conversation already saying, hey, I, I, I like this guy and I feel confident that he knows what he's talking about. The other piece is just like putting content, whether it's on LinkedIn or on your website and just speaking to your expertise. So that could be a, a blog post that is just helping people solve challenges without needing your software, right? Just common things in their industry that they're looking to solve. It could be content that you're putting on social media. Some of that could be, you know, uh, a way to capture some data. So maybe you ask them to put in their email address to download something, or maybe just put it out there and just let people check it out for free. There are differing strategies on that. But I think if people recognize that you know what you're talking about and you're not just some schmuck who is trying to sell them something they don't need, they're far more likely to actually spend time learning about your product uh, or whatever service that you offer to determine whether or not it's a good fit for them. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's that's the goal for all of us, right, is... Certainly if you're coming from a position, it's much more in the tech industry where you've got a a good chunk of people who've never used the technology that they've created. They've created some technology because they know there's a need in the market and they've created it to fill that gap, but they've never actually been the person on the other end of the desk who might have benefited from that. So they really struggle to both articulate well in a sales and marketing capacity, what what their product does, because all they can see is the challenge that they've created it to solve, but also... You know, then from a consultative capacity of how do you use this tool to really get the most out of it? Um, there are so many businesses that struggle with that. So then it becomes easy for those other businesses who are like yourself, Rob, who are experts at what they do first and have built the technology to solve the problems that they face and are now that to the world. I think that's a really powerful narrative to be able to to share with prospective clients. Um, so 
Rob, it's been it's been fantastic to have you on the show. Thank you very much for your thoughts and insights around marketing in such a, I guess, a niche but still quite a broad space. Right, depending on depending on how you're looking at the context of it. Appreciate you coming on the show and spending time with us. And um, if anybody wants to reach out and learn more about what you guys do, where can they reach you, Rob? I mean, you can go to happytu.com. That's h a p p i t u dot com. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I am on there almost every day, so feel free to reach out, connect, follow, send me a direct message, and uh, you can just email me if you want. It's Dwyer, D-W-Y-E-R, at happy2.com. Fantastic. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for coming along and listening to the show, and we'll see you again next week. Always great. Thanks for joining us for today's show. Hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to feature on a future show, or you've got some ideas for folks who would make a great guest, please drop us a line. The contact details are in the show notes. We'd love to hear from you. Your host today was Paul Banks, founder at Javelin Content Management. Javelin specializes in helping busy business owners just like you to repurpose video content, taking all the stress and tech problems away, and turning your long-form video into literally hundreds of pieces of content without breaking the bank. If you want to launch your personal brand, become the vendor of choice for your audience, or maximize your sales revenue impact, we'd love to hear from you. Join us next week for the next episode, and don't forget to give us a subscribe and a review. Our podcast is only possible with your support.